And John Cook joins us now from Trinity Forest. Cookie, great to see you. 1992, Vegas was your third win of the season, joining Fred Couples and Davis Love the third. You also surpassed $1 million in earnings a la Couples and Love. How much was that a talking point in 1992? How much money you won and how often you won? Well, the problem is I, I want to might have won that much, but I spent the, at least double of that. So, it, you know, back in those days, it was make a dollar, spend two. But uh, it was a, a great time in my life, my golfing life. Uh, obviously, it was the best season that I'd had, um, you know, prior and, you know, probably since uh, as far as that goes. So uh, to win in Las Vegas, kind of just put a cap on the year of a really good year with three wins, three seconds. Two of those were in majors. Uh, you know, top three on the money list and that my uh, open championship money didn't even count, wasn't even official money. So I don't know how close I would have gotten to Fred and Davis, but uh, it was really, really a, a special year. I worked really hard after an injury coming back in 1989 in, in 90, 91. It all kind of, you know, took shape in 92. John, that was your first victory after that near miss in the open championship at Muirfield. This might be a very dumb question, but does that actually ease the sting of coming close to the Claret Jug, or do they live in two very separate universes? Uh, you know, Eamon, I, I, you know, I'd won a bit in my career, so I, I was ready to take that next step. Uh, I thought I always had a game to, to win major championships. Uh, that Open Championship was a bitter disappointment. Uh, it still stings. It still stings today, honestly. Uh, but even you know later that year, even with a second at the PGA at Bell Reeve to Nick uh, Nick Price, um, that one still hurt. But you know to to validate a, a nice season with uh, another win and get you know three wins on the year, uh, you know I can be very very proud of 1992 and what I accomplished and where I uh, took everything to that next level. Did you feel as though the Vegas tournament owed you one? Because two years earlier, at a different golf course, you'd been in a playoff with Bob Tway, and a bit of a dramatic ending that didn't quite go your way. Yeah, it, it did. Uh, where I, I, I flew a, a shot into the into the cup on the first playoff hole and end up losing the playoff, um, and that was you know kind of my comeback year in 1990. So. Uh, I had a nice run through Las Vegas. My father was the tournament director for a, a number of years, uh, so it always meant something very, very special to our family, uh, going to Las Vegas, being part of that community, uh, also you know, playing well in one of my father's events. You know, actually, you know, a little bit of more satisfaction to it, and we had everybody there. In fact, my wife threw me a, a birthday party on uh, that Saturday night, uh, before the final round that I didn't even know about. It was a surprise party there at the Mirage. She had set it up. We had like 35 people in and, you know, busloads of people coming out to the tournament on Sunday. And, uh, you know, friends and family, you know, were gathered around for the weekend. So to win in front of, you know, all those great special friends and family and, uh, and in front of my dad uh, was really, really special. Yeah, your dad's the tournament director. You got this big party. Everybody's around. Your dad's handing you the trophy at the end of the day. How would you compartmentalize that and not kind of look too far ahead into the future and kind of keep your eye on the ball, as it were? You know, it was it was very interesting. My mind was so far away from golf on that evening because, uh, you know, my, my, my family, my kids showed up, uh, you know, during that day. And all, all I could talk to my son Jason about was he scored six goals in a soccer game earlier that day. So, you know, you kind of put things back in perspective and, you're, you know, you're a father, you're a husband, you're a friend. Um, last thing on my mind really was uh, whatever, how many, maybe a three-shot lead going into Sunday. Um, it really, it kind of put things in perspective and kind of knocked me back down onto, you know, husband, father, friend level. And so when I went out on Sunday morning, I was so relaxed and ready to play. And I think my, I might have birdied my first hole, and I just said, man, this is mine. Keep your eye on the prize. You know what, we'll, 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 uh, we'll have hugs and kisses when we're done, but I got a job to do right now for the next four hours, and I, I took care of business. Back in 92, John, the Tour Championship ended the season in October. Vegas was pretty late on that schedule. What do you make of the current fall series now do you feel as though the events at this time of the year are in any way diminished or were diminished during that kind of wraparound schedule or do they actually have more of an identity now than they've had in recent years 
I've gone back and forth on this, Eamon, to tell you the truth. And, you know, we kind of like that schedule. I, I, I know that it's up against uh, the NFL and college football. I get that. Um, but, you know, these, these events right now, uh, they have purpose. They have meanings to the, these communities uh, that, that uh, support these events uh, at this time of year. Um, so I, I, I kind of I, I feel for these events. I know my father was part of these events and, and understanding what, you know, this community involvement means to, to these events, um, you know, and their foundations. So I, I would like to see these, you know, these events, you know, keep keep a place on the schedule, keep purpose on the schedule. Uh, also, you know, going back to this year's Ryder Cup, I don't think our team was very well prepared to play. They hadn't played golf in, in five weeks except for Max Homa and, and Justin Thomas. So, you know, I think that there's a place on the schedule for these events uh, going forward. And I, I just hope that there's some sort of happy medium that comes out of this because they are very, very special events to these communities. Cookie, you brought up the Ryder Cup, so why don't we keep talking about that? You were on the last American team to win on foreign soil. How much does that you know, give you a pit in your stomach and is a, a, a tough point for you when you look at all these years that have gone by and all of the losses that the American team has incurred? Yeah, it's uh, it, it was a hard watch, to tell you the truth, Damon. Uh, it was it, it's, it's difficult. I, I, I love the Ryder Cup. You know, being part of that 93 team was so special to me in a you know, very, very different sense than where my professional uh, career had gone. So, you know, being part of that team was, uh, we still talk about it. I see Lanny Watkins all the time. I talk to, you know, Lee Jansen all the time. I talk to, you know, Fred and, and Azinger. And, you know, we really have a special bond right there. Um, you know, being part of that team and to see what's going on now is is really heartbreaking. There's no real rhyme or reason for it. It's just, you know, they're kind of in a bad spot, you know, when they get to Europe, um, just as, uh, you know, Europe, when they come to the United States, it's just such a, you know, it, 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 it's not that the players don't care. I, I don't buy that. They care maybe uh, a, a lot, maybe too much sometimes. Uh, but it just hasn't been the you know the right time in getting everybody on the same page and playing you know well together. Um, at the same time, the way that the Europeans kind of kind of bind and, and uh, uh, find themselves, you know, just uh, at at the tops of their games at the right time. So it's it's a timing thing. But yeah, going back you know over 30 years now for uh, for a last win on on European soil, it's going to have to wait another couple years. So um, we'll have to wait and see how that all plays out. Uh, when we go back across the pond. You played for Tom Watson on that team back in 93. He was also the captain in 14 at Glen Eagles, John. He was a guy who famously called his own shots without fear or favour as a captain. That worked in 93. Some people say it didn't in 14. Have things gotten too pally-pally on the US team right now? Does the captain give too much weight to players who want to play with people who make them comfortable? And is it time for a captain who has a little bit more of Watson in him? Uh I believe so, uh, Amen. And you know who doesn't love Zach Johnson? I, I know that. But you know, clearly something going you know, to Europe is, is not working. Uh, and Tom Watson had one assistant captain, um, Stan Thursk, his actual his teacher at the time. So it wasn't like he had other players and, and other other players involved, except his two picks were Raymond Floyd and Lanny Watkins, who. Um, you know, they acted as, as captains in that in that team room. Uh, you know, great experience, great to bounce things off feelings, how, how you're feeling. Uh, right now, it, it, it's hard. Um, you know, I know they have the task force. I know they have a lot, a lot of people involved. But I think it's you, uh, you appoint a captain to be the captain. Uh, not delegate, you know, a, a bunch of different duties to different people. So maybe it is time to have you know, a, a captain that is serves as the captain for uh, longer than, than, you know, one cycle. Uh, and that, that could be his job and to get better at his job and, and create a team that is going to bind, you know, bind together, um, you know, for, for one single purpose, and that's to win that Ryder Cup. So, uh, you know, th there's a lot of discussion, I'm sure, out there on, on what went wrong. I know uh, in, in Italy they had a lot of uh, past captains go over, uh, so, you know, the, the team got to see, you know, the Lanny Watkins, Curtis Strange, Raymond Floyd was over there, Trevino, uh, all, all the great captains that we've had. They were all over there, um, but they weren't really part of the, the actual team experience. So um, maybe they got to 
you know, get everybody together and, and get these guys, get their head spaces uh, where they need to be. And um, something clearly needs to be done. Well, Tiger Woods transcends different generations. Davis Love III basically said it's Tiger's job if he wants it, was a victorious President's Cup captain. What would Tiger Woods bring to the table as captain at Beth Page in 2025? Well, he'd certainly bring tons of respect, uh, tons of knowledge, experience, uh, both on the good side and the bad side. And uh, he, 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 he crosses generations. He, he's friends with the, you know, the, the young kids, but he's also friends with the experienced veterans that he leaned on you know, during his early days. So maybe he can bring a little bit of combination uh, to that team room with you know, young experience, uh, you know, not a lot of skeletons in the closet, and also older experiences on how, how to win and also how to lose. We've done all of it all together. So uh, it, it would be, he, he kind of just goes <laughs> back and forth with the generations. John, there's a lot of controversy in Rome about this idea of whether or not players ought to be paid for a Ryder Cup. And to be fair, it wasn't just a Rome conversation. This conversation has been around for many right. years at this point. Where do you fall on this idea? Do players deserve to be compensated beyond the charity dollars they get at the Ryder Cup? Or should they be expected to play for free for three days every two years? You know, it's, it's, that's such an interesting uh, you know, dynamic and, and what's going on. Uh, everybody that basically is over there for the PGA Tour, for the PGA of America, for, you know, the television networks and everybody else, they're all getting paid to go do, you know, their job. Um, so I certainly see the idea that was brought back in 1999 from Mark O'Mara, David Duvall, and a, and a, and a host of others. Uh, certainly understand the monetary aspects of it on, on who's making all the money and, and where it's all being distributed to. Um, it, Charitable contributions are, are phenomenal. They're great. They've really helped a lot of our foundations and a lot of our, um, you know, where, you know, some of where our, our ties lie in those foundations and what we're doing for the, the charitable uh, aspects of the world. So um, I, I'm not sure that they really actually want to be paid money cash. Just they want a little bit more recognition on, on what they're doing and, and who's doing what, where that money is all going. Uh, I think that's a valid, valid question. Conversation that will no doubt continue up to Beth Page and perhaps beyond as well. Cookie, we always appreciate the time. Have a great week in Dallas. Uh, we're, having a, we're having a blast. Jackson T. Stevens Cup is uh, on its way and running, and we're happy to be part of it.